But in general, I think the world will evolve uh, away from the U.S. dollar over time. But it doesn't happen overnight. And I think uh, the dollar has peaked out. Uh, it peaked out in October of last year, in other words, 12 months ago. Then the dollar weakened considerably against the euro, and then the, euro, the dollar strengthened again. But I think it's weakening again at the present time. But to your question specifically, all currencies are bad. Hi, all. This is Andy Maladin with my great pleasure today. I'm talking with uh, Mark Faber, the publisher and editor of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report. You can uh, check out the website at gloomboomdoom.com. Mark, it is an absolute pleasure of mine. Thank you for coming on today. Well, thank you for having me on your program. And good day to your viewers and listeners. Thank you very much. I just want to get right into it. Um, we have two well-known wars, um, wars going on everywhere, but two well-known wars that are going on right now. I wanted to get your thoughts on the uh, global implications of these and what does this mean, again, for the overall economy um, that's happening right now? Um, and yeah, if we can just start with that, if I can get your comments on that. Well, I mean, the cause of the wars is essentially uh, a world that is uh, still living like in the 19th century of Europeans and Americans and their belief that they can dictate policies and cultures and uh, economics of the poor countries of the world. By poor countries, I mean countries that have a GDP per capita that is inferior to the U.S. and the Western European countries, but that have le very large economies, say like China or India. I mean, India has just overtaken Britain as the fifth largest economy in the world. And this is an entirely different world than uh, what we had in the 19th century. If you think of the opium wars in China, uh, which took place in the 19th century. The reaction of Britain was to send an army and to force uh, China to cede territories and to pay the British huge indemnities in silver. Uh, this wouldn't happen nowadays. We have a totally different geopolitical condition in the world. We have nations that are large in terms of population and that have developed uh, an identity, uh, a nationalism, and uh, the Western world still dreams of the French going to Africa and telling the Africans what to do, and the British sending a useless foreign minister to India and tell them what to do. I mean, when you look as an international observer, and I lived in Hong Kong since 73, uh, and now in Thailand for the last 20 years, when you look at it, you have to love what the Western world actually thinks they can do and what the perception is of the Asians vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the imperial powers of the West. So these right. international tensions arise, and there are all kinds of war cycle series, but they er tend to arise when you have a country that uh, challenges the he hegemony of another country, in other words, say Germany, 1870 to 1910, it grew at a much faster pace than Britain. And in 1910, the German economy exceeded the size of the British economy. So it was perceived by Britain as a threat to the international order. And this is happening now in the world. Uh, you can't open a newspaper without seeing something by an American author or journalist criticizing China and putting China in a, in a bad light. And uh, this leads then to tensions uh, that can explode at any time. This we have to be aware. <laughs> right. But so, uh, the war is uh, an expression 
of a perceived threat. And uh, it depends how you look at the world uh, philosophically. Is China a threat or is it a natural event in the course of history that the country becomes more important than another? Now, if you look at, say, Roman history, you would say the Goths, <laughs> the Alemans, and the Franks were all threats to the Romans. But on the other hand, they also supplied later on soldiers to the Romans and even emperors. So I think we have to accept that the world is not the same. There's constant change. And we have to adapt to these changes and through diplomatic efforts, try to keep the tensions down. But the American neocons, as you know, they actually like to fight. If they see a nail somewhere in the world, they will go with a hammer and hit it. They don't even try diplomacy. Right. So that really leads me, do you see this... Um, escalating, escalating in the sense that even more wars, wars coming on in the, in the future, in the near future, or do you think, um, yeah, I mean, just with the American and globalization, American globalization, or do you see countries becoming more, uh, nationalistic and becoming more self-sustaining if you would. I wouldn't know how to answer this question because According to the Secretary of the Treasury in the U.S., Janet Yellen, the U.S. has enough money to finance two wars, so they have enough money to finance a hundred wars. And the neocons, they perceive China as a real threat, and I wouldn't rule out that uh, they would take measures that provoke China the same way they provoked Russia into an aggression in Ukraine by wanting to include Ukraine into NATO. The whole problem could have been solved through diplomacy by declaring Ukraine a neutral country. You understand? Then everybody would have been halfway happy. But no, they wanted to provoke Russia. And they can do the same with Taiwan. For Chinese, Taiwan is part of China. The way Hong Kong belongs to China, there's no question, it's not debatable. But in 2018, American NGOs, they went and financed the student demonstrations because they wanted to put China in a bad light. What is the result? The result is that tighter security laws were introduced in Hong Kong. There's less freedom. And uh, the expatriates, uh, to a large extent, I'm not saying all the expatriates left, a lot of expatriates left. Yeah. This is the result of American foreign policies that have no understanding of uh, different cultures and different systems. America. Although their democracy is uh, deficient and although their democracy isn't an old institution at all, because black people and women couldn't vote until the 20th century, they are the champions of democracy, an unproven system, and they cannot accept other countries that are differently structured. Right. That leads me to this has implications really on the um how we would trade um and i i guess what i want to lead to is i was always in the camp that um the u.s dollar was on the way out if you would um and i still am on that camp but i guess what then meaning you, I guess, working this out is you have all these countries that are mad at the U.S. They no longer want to use the U.S. dollar then because of the U.S. government and the neocons imposing their will, if you would. But they don't want to yeah. use the U.S. dollar then because of all this, but they don't really have much of a choice, right? Talk to me about that. What's 
what is this, what, the, what are the implications for global trade and using, and what currency would they use? Well, uh, let's put it this way. The U.S. dollar is strong because uh, you take a Japanese 10 years bond, it yields 0.9% uh, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And you take a 10 years U.S. treasury. A few days ago, it hit 10, uh, it hit 5%. percent. Now it rallied and is at a 4.55% uh, or thereabouts. And so there is an interest rate differential which, which supports the U.S. dollar. Number two, the U.S. still has a legal system that people trust more than, say, the legal system of Zimbabwe or of uh, Myanmar and China and so forth. So uh, this is a consideration when people have money in a, in a state, in a, in a country, that they are protected or the property rights are somehow protected uh, by institutions that function. And thirdly, the U.S., as you know, has a reserve currency. But increasingly now, and this doesn't happen from one day to another, increasingly, we have countries that trade with each other outside of the U.S. dollar. In other words, say China purchases oil from Saudi Arabia. They can settle that in uh, yuan or RMBs or, I suppose, Saudi Arials. And I think the reason these countries do that increasingly is that the U.S. throws the assets of different countries that they didn't like. So why would someone hold all his money in the, in the U.S. Federal Reserve System? So I think over time this will happen. And like you, I live in Thailand, so I can see the price level. The price level is, of course, much, much lower than in the U.S. for most services. Now for some goods, like if you want to buy a luxury car, it is cheaper in America than in Thailand because we have very high uh, taxes on imports of luxury goods. But in general, I think the world will evolve uh, away from the U.S. dollar over time. But it doesn't happen overnight. And I think uh, the dollar has peaked out. Uh, it peaked out in October of last year, in other words, 12 months ago. Then the dollar weakened considerably against the euro, and then the, euro, the dollar strengthened again. But I think it's weakening again at the present time. But to your question specifically, all currencies are bad. The question is, which one is the least bad? I would say, as an investor, you should have some uh, money in bonds and cash and equities and so forth, but you should also have money in uh, assets that you cannot multiply easily, such as precious metals. As an example, gold, silver, platinum, and uh, young people, they prefer the cryptocurrencies. But in my opinion, the cryptocurrency, the failure of cryptocurrency is the following. Envision an emergency situation, like in Gaza. What happens? They switch off the electricity. They switch off communication. Then try to go and pay something with a credit card. Cryptocurrency. <laughs> no way. But if you have small denomination gold coins or silver coins, you can go anywhere in the world and someone will accept it. But the society, the next war, will be decided by action that destroys the complex infrastructure that we have nowadays. You know, in a city, the food has to be shipped from the countryside to the cities, the vegetables and the, all the ingredients for bread and the meat has to come. In a city like New York, inside the city, you have maybe 
inventories that will last 10 days maximum. Right. And this whole infrastructure can easily be stopped. I mean, if you go to a hotel and you want to check out, then the, the lady at the checkout counter says, sorry, the computer system is down. How do you check out? It just happened to me. You don't check it out. It happens <laughs> all the time. And then <laughs> the, the problem out. is not the hotel. The problem is you miss your flight. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that really raises the question then about gold and, and silver, really. Um, I'm an investor in both. Why, why hasn't, um, why hasn't it gone up significantly higher with, with all of the chaos <laughs> in going on and, and all of the, uh, the money printing, if you go on, I would, I would expect it to be at least double of where it currently is at these current levels. Well, let's put it this way. Uh, when I started to work in 1970, gold was at $35 an ounce. Okay. And today it's uh, close to $2,000. At least in my opinion, it kept its purchasing power. Now, someone may come to me and prove that an investment in the S&P 500 with uh, dividend accruals, in other words, dividends reinvestment, would have outperformed gold, silver, and platinum over the same period of time. Probably that is true, but uh, the outperformance would be applicable to the U.S., many other markets, and many other currencies. Uh, would would have underperformed an investment in gold at $35 an ounce. Let's go closer. Uh, in year 1999, gold was trading at the low of $255. Okay. I remember that. And now we're close to the 2000. 2000. During this period, 1990 to today, I'd say gold has probably outperformed most stock markets in the world. I can give you many stock markets that are lower today than they were in year 99, 2000. Not the U.S., it is higher. But uh, in general, let's say you have a health insurance <laughs> and the car insurance, uh, and you pay every year so and so much into your in insurance premiums. At, and after 20 years, you say, well, it was a bad investment to have an insurance because I was never sick and I never had an accident. So let's fabricate an accident <laughs> or a sickness. <laughs> you, you understand? I mm -hmm. think with gold, you don't want something horrible to happen because if something really horrible happens in the world, if politicians could lock you in during COVID, and tell you you can't leave your house and you can't smoke on your balcony and so forth, they can take your gold away. They can take everything away from you. They can lock you up. And so you don't want, as a gold hold, anything horrible to happen. But uh, in my view, if you look at the pattern of central banks and the rate of inflation in the U.S., which had a strongly growing economy between 1800 and 1900, no central bank and no American economies. <laughs> the American economy developed very well. And uh, the fiscal expenditures of the U.S. were in the 19th century around 3% of GDP in 1910. No European country, no the U.S. had a budget, I mean, uh, government expenditures of more than 12% of GDP. Now it's in Europe around 50% of GDP. And in the U.S., if you include everything, probably around 45%. Officially, it's 42%. But uh, you understand, we have now a central bank and we had inflation. And we have a huge level of debts. And in my view, if I look at the financial system, uh, we can solve 
the problems of the financial system in three ways, defaults, massively higher taxes, or printing of money. And believe me, the central banks and the governments will print money because that's the easiest tax to raise on people right. through inflation. Inflation is a tax. Yes. So, game that out in the sense that they're going to print money. What implications does that have for long term for central banks? Because I asked that because I remember reading Jim Rogers. This was years ago, and I'm a big fan of Jim Rogers as well. He was of the opinion that central banks eventually will not exist because they're not needed and because or not only are they not needed, but because of what you said, they're, they're just going to print themselves into oblivion and people will no longer accept them. Is that an opinion that you would share? Yes, maybe in the very long run, but we shouldn't uh, dismiss the usefulness of a central bank entirely. It's just that it's outgrown uh, its usefulness and it abused its power. If you understand, uh, yeah. I think until the 1960s and so forth, central banks were reasonably disciplined. If I look at the writings and the economic philosophy of earlier central bankers, and I compare them with the money printing uh, philosophy that today's central banks have, uh, then there's a big difference. Okay. It's about, uh, you see, the capitalistic system and the free market depends very much on trust, that you trust the laws, that you trust the system. Uh, and uh, if you print money, then uh, the trust uh, diminishes or eventually vanishes entirely. And uh, people then uh, have to live with consequences that can be very unpleasant. I mean, I have a book. If you are interested in what the effects of inflation are, this is the best uh, work about inflation. It's called The Economics of Inflation, you can see, by Bresciano Turoni. Mm -hmm. And it was written by this professor, Bresciano Turoni, at the time, 1918 to 1923, he was at the Reichsfinanzministerium uh, in uh, Berlin. And he described the impact of money printing, I mean, they had to print money to pay the reparation on society, on stock prices, on the foreign exchange rate, and on the corporate behavior, and then, then. I mean, it's a very detailed account of what inflation does to an entire society. And uh, my view would be, by printing money, you can solve near-term problems. In other words, you don't solve them, you postpone them. But the longer-term implications of printing of money are disastrous on society because you can see it yourself in the last three years, say, in America. There's no <laughs> question that prices have gone up more than wages. Yes. So in re it's a, you can show as the government, you can show economic growth. But the realities for the majority of people, and normally these are lower class uh, people, I, I mean, income wise, right. I'm not talking about the human aspect of people, but about the income, lower income recipients and young people. They have then an affordability issue. Uh, today, housing starts are no higher than in 1970. Right. And the population is up more than 50%. So the real economy is suffering. But, and this is also described in this book, it leads to a concentration of wealth among few people that know how to play the inflation game. Right. Right. The the, the successful speculator. Yeah. The people that own assets. Um, so. Yes, precisely. Does, yeah. So how does this play out 
if you can transition to just general economies, whether that's energy or base metals and that sort of thing. Obviously, in the inflation game, all of this is going to get more expensive, but yet, especially in the industrial commodities and even agricultural commodities, um, they've, they're not, they've sold off quite a bit. Um, so talk to me about that. I mean, projecting that out over the next several years, where do you see commodities in general going? Well, I, we have to make certain assumptions. My view would be, uh, if I look at the price of wheat, corn, soybeans, and I compare it to the quantity of money, or I look at, uh, wheat, corn, soybeans, and, and so forth, and I compare it to the price of gold, agricultural commodities are about at the lowest level they've ever been. Right. Number two, uh, in, a environment of increasing international tensions as we have, uh, shortages can develop very quickly. So I would not rule out that there could be price explosions among food uh, items. And uh, my view of someone who wants to hedge and be relatively uh, safe, he should buy some property in the countryside in a small village in proximity of water, of, of a river. And he could live from his land. It would involve some effort on his side, you know, to plant trees and vegetables and so forth. You need two or three wives who do that for you. <laughs> yeah, but right. uh, you, you understand, the vulnerability is to be in a city. The moment you are alone in the countryside with other villagers, but you can't project yourself to be a rich guy. You know, you have to go as an ordinary citizen, as like a retiree or half a little bit dum dum. You can't be an arrogant character in that new environment. And uh, you have to integrate yourself into the village life. But that is a safe way to survive, say, uh, a difficult situation in the world. Got it. Is there any specific geographical regions around the um, the the earth or the, around the world that you would be looking at? Like that are obviously, yeah, you, you live in Thailand. Is that a spot that you'd be interested in or you think of as an investor? Or um, I have to laugh because in a global conflict, uh, the conflict zone would probably be somewhere in Eastern Europe, you understand, towards uh, Russia and in Asia. For sure, it would be centered around China. Now, there's several ways to get into China, either through Russia, and therefore Chinese have actually an interest that Russia is not damaged by American interests. Uh, and from the north, from Alaska, and uh, an, uh, an invasion of, say, Chinese territory from the north, and from Japan, South Korea, and then southern China would be vulnerable, and the war theater would be where I live, actually, <laughs> in the in the Golden Triangle, Cambodia, Laos, northern Thailand. Uh, North and Vietnam and so forth. Uh, so I'm not living in a very desirable location. In bit, when if you're really looking for safety, if you're look, looking for safety, Latin America in a global conflict would probably be kind of on the side. And Europe is so irrelevant politically and geographically. I mean, if you have a house in Portugal. In a small town, who will be interested in you? No one. Or Spain or Sicily. Uh, you have maybe other problems in Sicily. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, you, you have to go into places that are irrelevant. Now, if you chose a place that is irrelevant before the Second World War, you might have chosen, say, Papua New Guinea, and it became the war theater. So... Uh, 
it's sometimes difficult. Right. How about for opportunity? Where would you go? Um, not, not so much for safety, but for opportunity. Yes. Uh, to this theme, I'd like to point out over the last 10 years or 12 years, the U S has outperformed emerging economies, uh, their financial markets and their currencies dramatically. Uh, emerging markets in absolute terms are not as cheap as they were in 2009 and 2003 at the bottom of the bear market that began in 2000. But relative to the U.S., they've never been this inexpensive. Similar, uh, energy stocks in the U.S. have yeah. never been this inexpensive compared to the S&P 500 in terms of weighting or compared to the fund and fund related stocks. Mm -hmm. So uh, my view would be for really good opportunities. And I give you two examples. At the end of uh, 2021, I said, uh, and I wrote that Turkey was very inexpensive because everything was bad in Turkey and the stock market had gone down. And the currency had collapsed because, as you know, in Turkey, we had inflation of around 80% and now 100%. But the economy functions perfectly well. It, but it hurts the poor people. But the economy goes on. And Erdogan, contrary to what people say, is actually quite popular. Anyway, in 2022, the Turkish stock market went up by about 100% in US dollars. Okay. There's a Turkish ETF, it doubled. And then in 2023, the market that has gone up, actually almost the most, is uh, Iraq. I read it. <laughs> yeah, we have an Iraq fund. It's up 90% in the first nine months of this year. And now I think that Brazil, Colombia, and Argentina look attractive as markets. I think they can go up substantially. Now, someone will tell me, well, everything is bad. Yes, correct. Everything is bad. And that's why stocks are cheap. If you want to buy cheap assets, real estate, stocks, bonds, you have to buy when everything looks bad. Right, right. But I would invest in emerging markets. And uh, I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion, which I very much enjoy. I mentioned that American media always puts down China. Uh, the mood about investing in Hong Kong and in China has never been this negative. And I lived in Hong Kong since 73, and I still have an office there. Everybody is selling as soon as the market rallies a bit. But I think, I mean, my friend, he just attracted my attention to Hong Kong land. They own prime properties in the center of Hong Kong, and it sells at 0.22% of net asset value. Okay, I agree the asset value will go down, but maybe not by 80%. Right. Do you understand? It's interesting. Because it's... Hong Kong still has a lot of advantages. Yeah. No, it does. Yeah, and you, you know a lot more than me. It's interesting. It's like uh, just really buy when there's blood in the streets. Um, that's what this, you remind me of, I mean, or even Warren Buffett, buy when things are cheap, <laughs> greedy when things are cheap, and, yeah. and be afraid and be, when it's very expensive, things are expensive. So, uh, well, I don't take away too much of your time. I want to thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today. Uh, you've been very kind. Um, I will put your, if you want to give a shout out, you, people can reach you or find you at gloomboomanddoom.com or gloomboomdoom.com. Um, yeah. and then I will put a link to uh, your website and your contact info in the show notes, uh, on this. So I want to thank very kind you. Of you. Uh, you're very kind. I want to thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, I mean, a final word, I believe that, uh, we don't know much about history and we don't even know a lot about the present. And we know essentially nothing about the future. 
depending on your risk profile, but for the typical investor, I think the best is to be diversified. And he has to be diversified, not only in different asset classes, like real estate, stocks, bonds, and commodities and precious metals and uh, cryptos, but he also has to be diversified geographically. I mean, people tend to forget almost half the world became worthless when the communists took over Russia and Eastern Europe and China and Vietnam. I mean, I have so many friends that had huge property wells in these countries. They lost everything, everything. Okay. And so my view would be you need to be diversified and not just diversified by having foreign stocks in an account with a city group in New York, but you need to have different accounts in different countries. In other words, that some of your money is held by a different sovereign state than the U.S. And under the U.S., I would put Europe and Canada and Australia, the vassal states of the US. <laughs> right. So I would be, I, I mean, fairly diversified. Got it. Well, thank you again so much for your, uh, for your thoughts, <laughs> uh, uh, Mark, and I'd love to have you on again. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yep. And take care and have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.